Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we now turn in our study of the Iliad to book 19. Uh, Fagels calls this the champion arms for battle. This will, of course, be Achilles' um, Aristia, that type scene of the battle. And we're going to see this. And in the very end of this book, in fact, we're going to see this uh, played out remarkably well. Now, if you haven't been following my lectures on LearnStrong.net, I recommend that you go to the AP folder. Let's do a quick review, as we like to do, of the major events of the Iliad book by book really quickly. Again, individual lectures on each one of these books. Book one, The Invocation of the Muse. Agamemnon Achilles go at it. Book two, Agamemnon's bad dream where Zeus will tell him everything is great, you're going to win. The catalog of the ships and of course the catalog of chariots is a part of that. Book three, we've got Paris fighting Menelaus. We think the war was probably over because Menelaus has destroyed Paris in the fight, but no, we're going to have of course Aphrodite saving Paris in book four. We're going to have Zeus versus Hera and Hera is going to convince Zeus to let Troy fall. Pandarus, the great Trojan um, shooter of the bow, will wound Menelaus and now the war's back on. Book five, we've got Diomedes Aristia. Um, uh, he, in fact, will wound both Aphrodite and, and, and Ares, two gods, during that book. And in book six, very pivotal book, Hector back in Troy with his wife Andromache and his young son Aesthetics, and that'll be the last time that he will see them. Book seven, we have the great Ajax or Ajax fighting against Hector, and then finally a truce or a standoff in book eight. Zeus and his famous scales deciding that the Trojans will assent because uh, the promise that he's made to Thetis, Achilles' mom, and Hector will begin his rise. Book nine, Agamemnon figures it out. We need Achilles, send the embassy of Odysseus, Phinox, and Aix, and Achilles will say no. We paused after this in books one through nine for a review, um, and I talked about this as Achilles' crisis of faith, his rejection of the warrior code, namely Time, that idea that honor matters, scooby snacks, the things we get, and kleos, or glory, matter. And in, at the conclusion of book nine, Achilles has said about both of those, not interested anymore. That's going to make the reading of book 19 here for us a very interesting book as we turn to it. In book 20, we have Diomedes and Odysseus doing their night raid. They will jack Dolan, the great Tro the, the Trojan warrior. And in book 11, we have Agamemnon's Aristia. Ultimately, Achilles, watching the defeat of the Greeks, will send Patroclus to ask Nestor what's going on. And that will, of course, begin the end of our, of, of our project. In book 12, we have the Trojans at the trench, at the wall, at the rampart. We have Hector's boulders smashing a hole into that. In book 13, we have Poseidon, who is going to, through the form of Calchas, try to encourage the Greeks. We have Hector, who will be taunting Paris, and we will have, ultimately, Hector's scream there. We might make a note that book 13 for us is one of the last mentions of Paris in the, um, in the Iliad, and that's going to be a fascinating question. Where is Paris? He's there in very interesting ways, because Paris will be the one that ultimately kills, according to the myths, will be the one that kills Achilles. Book 14, we have, of course, sex and violence coming together in really graphic ways. Hera seduces Zeus, and because of that, Ajax is able to wound Hector with a boulder. Book 15, Zeus wakes up. He's very upset. He tells Poseidon to knock it off. He sends Apollo to heal Hector, and then we've got all kinds of Trojan uh, accomplishments. In book 16, we have the death of Zeus's son Sarpedon. We have, uh, by, by uh, Patroclus, we have Patroclus's Aristia, and then ultimately, of course, book 16 is pivotal, because it's there that Hector kills Patroclus. In book 17, there's a fight over Patroclus's body or corpse. Hector does the unthinkable and puts on Achilles' armor, and Antilochus will come be sent back to tell Achilles your best pal is dead. Book 18, Achilles will mourn Patroclus. He will call to his mom, his mom Thetis. She will go to Hephaestus, the great god of fire, to make the shield that in book 19, Achilles will wake up in the morning to see. Before we turn to book 19, though, I want you to consider this, because we're coming to the end. I mean, after this lecture, we'll have five, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, f uh, four lectures left, and then a fifth one maybe for a culminating lecture. Think about this for a moment. Each of the books of the Iliad raises powerful questions. That we'll call them philosophic questions, for lack of a better phrase. For example, in book 19, we have the question of the blame game, right? Who is at fault 
for all of the terrible suffering that has happened. Now, of course, you know that this is the theodicy question as we talk about it in our Milton lectures on Paradise Lost. That is to say, why do good things happen to bad people? I'm sorry, why do bad things happen to good people? No, it goes both ways, doesn't it, right? The theodicy question actually cuts both ways. But the obvious question is, dude, why is there so much really crummy pain and suffering in the world? And it doesn't seem like a lot of the people that get that pain and suffering deserve it. Especially because we have these gods that have all this power and are supposed to, like, take care of us and all of that. The Iliad, interestingly, answers why is bad stuff happened with blame it on Zeus. It's the will of Zeus in the opening lines of the Iliad. And for the rest of the Iliad, it's going to be Zeus and the other gods. You're going to hear this in Book 19. St. Augustine and Milton, two important Christian theorists who obviously had the advantage of reading at the Iliad, they had issues with blaming the gods in Greek mythology because, of course, if you can blame the god Zeus, then obviously you might be able to blame the god of, of Christian theology. And so the opening lines of Paradise Lost of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree brought death into it, blah, 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 blah. In other words, the notion here is that's why free will or free choice or agency as it sometimes was referred to, that's why it matters so much to both Augustine as well as to Milton. Of course, still we have the question from Paradise Lost and in our lectures on Paradise Lost and the Harvard Classics, you will find those there. Um, uh, that we still have the question of, well, yeah, but well, what about Satan? I mean, wasn't Satan, for example, created by God and allowed, remember, and, and all that? We got the scales and all of that that happened just like in the Iliad, okay? Isn't it blaming Satan just another, uh, another excuse to blame the gods? Gudama Buddha, you'll remember, under his Bodhi tree, comes to enlightenment and says life is dukkha, life is suffering. And the blame, well, humans who, you know, in karma, humans who want to somehow change karma, change, they have these desires that they can't. Modern science and psychology, obviously, that's the nature versus nurture debate. That is to say nature, DNA made me do it, versus nurture, my education, and how I was raised made me do it, right? Or cause suffering. But isn't blaming DNA kind of like blaming it on a god as well? In our conversations in 303, we like to answer the theodicy question, obviously, as we've said before, by asking, learning to ask when something bad happens, not why did this happen to me, but rather why did this happen for me, an attempt to go beyond the blame game and to accept personal responsibility, not always because of the things that happen in terms of my own life, but rather what I can do with those things, that is to say how I learn from those things. Let's watch how this idea works out in, in Book 19. Let's, let's do a quick review of Book 19. Um, first, Achilles gets his armor, he loves his armor, right? And then the book becomes a book of dialogue, right? First, Achilles will worry about Patroclus' body. Thetis' his mom says, don't worry, I'll give it ambrosia and nectar. Then Achilles has this piercing cry. We begin the book and end the book with a cry of Achilles. And the troops will muster. Then he forgives Agamemnon. He says, done is done. He blames it, interestingly, on Bryces. <laughs> Yeah, blame it on the girl that was taken uh, as a slave captive, right? Briseis. Fascinating, right? We're, we're going we're gonna to roll our eyes at a lot of this. Get ready, okay? Agamemnon says, it wasn't my fault, back to Achilles. It was Zeus. And then he tells this whole story about it, Hercules' birth and the way Athena, or the way Hera fooled Zeus and sent forth ruin on the planet, right? Again, we're back to the blame game again. Achilles says, um, to Agamemnon when he offers him all that time, all those rewards. He says, I, I don't care. Um, you know, he gets it anyway, but he doesn't care. He says, let's go and fight. Odysseus will step in and he says, you know what, here's the deal. Guys got to eat before they go and fight. And then he says to Agamemnon, yeah, you, you need to make an oath that you didn't touch Briseis and you need to give Achilles all of his Scooby snacks. And, 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 and that's exactly what happens. Achilles will say, all I want to do is slaughter. I could care less about Agamemnon's stuff. Odysseus says, um, get Achilles his teammate, and Agamemnon agrees, and a sacrifice is made. And then we have the Achilles grieving soliloquy, which is compelling. We'll get to it in a moment. There, he blames it all on Helen, and he as well mentions for the one of the few times we ever get mentions in the Iliad, Achilles has a boy, Neoptolemus, and we'll maybe want to say a little about him in a sec. We then have Zeus, who pities Achilles, sends Athena with ambrosia and nectar, because Achilles won't eat. And then finally we have Achilles' Aristia. He dresses for battle. First he's got his griefs, his legs. 
Then we have his breastplate, then a sword, then a shield, and a helmet. And he movement tests, he tests to, he tests to make sure he spins on his heels and he says, yes, everything is ready to go. Then um, he gets Father Peleus' massive spear, okay? Uh, and then finally his war team with his immortal horses. You have this very interesting dialogue with Achilles and his ponies at the end of Book 19 where he will blame them for the death of Patroclus. And then Roan Beauty, one of his ponies, is allowed to speak because Hera gives him the ability to speak. And he says, it wasn't us that killed your pal, it was Apollo, not Hector, interestingly. And the, po the pony says, you're next, you're soon to die. Achilles says, I know that, I, do, I, don't, I don't need to be told that, unlike Hector, Achilles knows what his future is like. And then one more high, um, um, loud, um, um, nasty cry, right? And we all, we know that lots and lots of Trojans are about to get jacked, right? All right, let's work through key lines um, and passages. Because this is a, di a passage of, of, of great dialogues, I'm fighting uh, my, my desire to just want to read the whole thing to you. But I, again, I, I realize for time. I'm going to try and do my best to get through this. All right, let's go to it. That is right away will speak to her son the opening lines of book 19. As dawn rose up in her golden robe from ocean's tides, bringing light to immortal gods and mortal men, Thetis sped Hephaestus' gifts to the ships. She found her beloved son lying face down, embracing Patroclus' body, sobbing, wailing, and round him crowded troops of mourning comrades. And the glistening goddess moved among them now, seized Achilles' hand and urged him, spoke his name. My child, leave your friend to lie there dead. We must, though it breaks our hearts. The will of the gods has crushed him once for all. But here, Achilles, accept this glorious armor. Look, a gift from the god of fire, burnished bright, finer than any mortal has ever borne across his back. The goddess laid the armor down at Achilles' feet and the gear clashed out in all its blazoned glory. A tremor, we're told, ran through all the Remedan ranks. None dared to look straight at the glare. Each fighter shrank away, not Achilles. The, move, the more he gazed, the deeper his anger went, his eyes flashing under his eyelids, fierce as fire. This will be the motif of all these books to come now, fire. Exulting, holding the gods' shining gifts in his hand. So uh, here, here um, uh, Achilles is very, very pleased, right? He, Achilles will then say, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really worried about Patroclus because I'm not going to bury him until I get this project done with Hector. What can I do? It will be Thetis who will say in line 35, Oh, my child, wipe those worries from your mind. I'll find a way to protect him from those swarms, the vicious flies that devour men who fall in battle. He could lie there till uh, dead till a year has run its course and his flesh still stand firm even fresher than now. And then a few lines later at, 40, at 45 or so, Brilliant Achilles, uh, I'm sorry, she breathed in, in, in her son tremendous courage, then instilled in Patroclus' nostrils fresh ambrosia, blood-red nectar too, to make his flesh stand firm. We're then told that Achilles will call the muster. Brilliant Achilles at line 48, strode along the surf, crying his piercing cry. Again, we're going to begin and end this book with this shrieking or piercing cry of Achilles. Roused the Achaean warriors, even those who'd kept to the beached ships till now, the helmsmen who handled the heavy steering oars. And, um, and, and he's going to call all of them together. And now, as they're all called together at line 63, he will speak. Agamemnon. Again, I wish I could read all this speech. I, I won't. Agamemnon. Was it better for both of us after all, for you and me to rage at each other, racked by anguish, consumed by heartsick strife, all for a young girl? Blames it on Briseis. If only Artemis had cut her, Briseis, down at the ships with one quick shaft. That day I destroyed Lyceris, chose her as my prize. How many fewer friends had gnawed the dust of the wide world, brought down by enemy hands, while I raged on and on. He does admit he raged, but he says the reason is because of the girl. Better? Yes, he says, for Hector and Hector's Trojans, not for the Argives. For years to come, interesting given what we're reading, for years to come I think, they will remember the feud that flared between us both. Enough. Let bygones be bygones. Done is done. And so you have then this exchange of the dialogue that begins with Achilles saying to Agamemnon, I'm finished. Enough of it.
Agamemnon steps up, has a little statement about no one interrupt while I'm talking. Make sure that you stand and, and you're quiet. We're going to see this same kind of sentiment at the conclusion of the second book of, second part of Beowulf, when King Rothgar stands and all of the, we're told all the themes are silent and pay attention. And he says it this way, I will declare my inmost feelings to Achilles, and you, the rest of you, our guys, listen closely. Every man of you here, mark each word I say, often the armies brought this matter up against me, they would revile me in public, but I am not to blame. Zeus and fate and the fury stalking through the night, they are the ones who drove that savage madness in my heart that day in assembly when I seized Achilles' prize, Briseis, on my own authority. True, but what could I do? Again, we have a refusal to accept personal responsibility. Blame it on the gods, he says, all right? A god impels all things to their fulfillment. Ruin, eldest daughter of Zeus, she blinds us all. That fatal madness, she with all those delicate feet of hers never touching the earth. Again, notice a guy blaming it on a girl, right? A goddess, right? To trap us, she entangles one man, now another. Why, she in her frenzy blinded Zeus one time. Highest, greatest of men and gods, they say. Even Father Zeus, Hera, deceived him blind. By the way, we're not speaking about book 14 here, although immediately any reader will come, you know, immediately come to mind to think about it. Feminine as she is and only armed with guile, he says about Hera. And then you've got this whole story about how Hera jacked with her husband, brother Zeus, King God Zeus, to make an oath about the birth of, an, uh, of Hercules, but it wasn't Hercules. In other words, the argument is for Agamemnon, Hera's trap. As he, will, as he will call it, at line 125. He finishes this one, um, and, and he says it this way, at line 163 or so. But, since I was blinded and Zeus stole my wits, I'm intent on settling things to rights at once. I'll give that priceless ransom paid, paid for friendship, gear up for battle now, and rouse the rest of your armies. And as for gifts, here I am to produce them all, all that good Odysseus promised you in full. We're told, though, that Achilles comes back and he says at line uh, 175, Feel Marshal Atreides, Lord of Ben Agamemnon, produce the gifts if you like as you see fit or keep them back. It's up to you. But now, quickly, call up the wild joy of war at once. I mean, we've got to be reminded, Achilles hasn't fought for this longest day and a few of the days that came before. So Achilles is ready to fight. Of course, you got all these wounded warriors standing over there, we're told in this book. you got Odysseus over there wounded. you got, obviously, Agamemnon wounded. you got, you know, and on and on the list goes, right? You got Diomedes wounded, right? He says, but quickly, call up the wild joy of war at once. It's wrong to malinger here with talk, wasting time. Our great work lies all before us, still to do. In other words, he says, it's time to go to war, time to fight. Odysseus joins in as, as this dialogue unfolds at line 185. But, fine, but Odysseus, fine at tactics, answered firmly, Not so quickly, brave as you are, God like Achilles. Achaea's troops are hungry, Odysseus, always driven by his belly. When we do the Odyssey, we're going to come back to this. Everything for Odysseus is about his tummy, although he has a fine mind as well. Don't drive our troops against Troy to fight the Trojans. It's no quick skirmish shaping. Odysseus knows we're not going to remember this is the Odysseus that's going to invent the Trojan horse that finally leads to the fall of Troy it's not going to end with just the death of Hector and, and Odysseus seems to know that nobody else seems to get it once the mass formations of men began to clash with a god breathing fury in both sides at once no command from them to take their food and wine by the fast ships a soldier's strength and nerve in other words Odysseus says we got to feed our troops and then at the very end of the speech he says and you great son of Atreus, in other words, Agamemnon. You must be more just to others from now on. By the way, when he uses this word justice, we'll immediately think of Republic and, of course, Book One and the question of what is justice, right? He says, he's preaching at it. You must be more just. It's no disgrace for a king to appease a man when the king himself was first to give offense. Then we're told, at line 220, the Lord of men, Agamemnon, answered warmly. He's ready to take advice. Let's put that in our notes. Agamemnon, finally, ready to hear what people have to say to him. Son of Laertes, he says, I delight to hear your counsel. You've covered it all fairly point by point, he says. I gladly swear your oath. The spirit moves me now. 
nor will I break that oath in the eyes of any god. But let Achilles remain here for the moment, much as his heart would race him into war. The rest remain here too, all in strict formation, till the treasure trove is hauled forth from my tents, and we can seal our binding oaths in blood. In other words, Agamemnon says, I totally agree with you, let's solve this problem. Achilles, interestingly, is not interested in Scooby Snacks. He could care less about Timae. Go back to my comments in that review that I gave about Achilles' crisis of faith. He doesn't care about stuff once he realizes his death is imminent. Think about how we see this in Dickens' Christmas Carol with the Scrooge story. That first ghost of the Christmas past makes him a little mad. That second ghost makes him even madder. It's that third ghost that shows him his own tombstone. And it's at that point Scrooge could care less about all his millions. Why? Because once you see the moment of your death, you could care less about all that stuff. And this is kind of where Achilles is. And he says as much at line 235. Swift runner Achilles interjected, Field Marshal Atreides, Lord of Men, uh, Agamemnon, better busy yourself with that some other time, the stuff, the, the, the teammate. When a sudden lull in the fighting lets us rest, and the fury's not such fire inside my heart. Now our men are lying mauled on the field. Really? Really? Now, now you're ready to, to, to admit that? All that Hector the son of Priam overwhelmed when Zeus was handing Hector his high glory. But you, you and Odysseus urge us to a banquet? I, by God, I drive our eye guys into battle now, starving, famished, and only then, when the sun goes down, lay on a handsome feast. Once we've avenged our shame. It's fascinating. He calls it our shame. He says about eating, and it will be here that we begin to see, as I said in an earlier lecture, Achilles becomes godlike and more beast-like at the same time. Notice here, he says, you talk of food? I have no taste for food. What I really crave is slaughter and blood and the choking groans of men. But Odysseus, cool tactician, tried to calm him, we're told. Achilles, son of Peleus, greatest of the Achaeans, greater than I, stronger with spears by no small edge. Yet, I might just surpass you in season judgment. Nice irony, right? By quite a lot, since I have years on you, right? That is to say, Odysseus is older than Achilles. And I know the world much better. This idea of knowing the world much better sets us up for our study of the Odyssey, by the way. So let your heart be swayed by...